attending today's lecture recital. And if you are on live stream, thank you for tuning in. My name is Bernard Tan, and I'm very honored and excited today to be presenting this lecture recital to you, titled Kinyin to Singing, The Language of Mandarin Chinese, Its Phonetics in Singing, and Its Music. If you are here today, or if you are tuning in, you're probably interested by the idea of singing in Mandarin Chinese and what has in inspired me to do this. As a collaborative pianist, especially one who works with singers most of the time, I was fascinated by how we're able to approach vocal music from, say, Italy, Germany, or France, and so on, to sing in their languages with great degree of authenticity without necessarily knowing how to speak the language. A non-French speaking person can sing Carmen in Paris Opera House and be understood, and a non-Russian speaking baritone can perform Yevgeny Onyegin in Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow without making people question the language he's singing in. The possibility of performing a foreign language with authentic pronunciations in singing is, in my opinion, one of the best things Western music has had. Singing in these languages are made possible thanks to the contribution of people like Thomas Grubb in his book Singing in French, Evelina Kolodny in Italian, Emily Olin in Russian, and of course our very own professor Timothy Cheek in the Czech language. This also in turn opened up a gateway to the beautiful uh, vocal repertoire. As someone who grew up playing Chinese folk songs and art songs with singers, I wonder, what if there's a way to open a gateway for non-Chinese speakers to sing in Chinese? What if I'm able to figure out a way to teach English speakers to sing in Chinese? Last summer, I then embarked on a journey of researching about the Chinese language, its phonetic properties, and combining with my experience of coaching singers in lyric diction of other languages, I managed to come up with a way to methodize Chinese pronunciation for the purpose of singing. This is how today we're able to have three non-Chinese speakers singing Chinese music along with a Chinese speaker, my fellow Malaysian Louis Ong, who like I do, consider Mandarin Chinese our native language, although we also learn other languages in our country. In today's lecture recital, I'm trying to achieve three aims. Firstly, we'll explore the history of the Chinese language and how the language evolved through time for us to know how it is pronounced. Secondly, we'll investigate how we use the pinyin system along with the phonetic properties that it shows to achieve authentic pronunciation in the context of singing. Finally, and perhaps most, most importantly, we'll appreciate the beauty of art songs and folk songs written in the Chinese language through performance. One of the biggest reasons why I'm motivated to do this is because of the vast amount of beautiful vocal music we find in this language. In the Chinese-speaking countries, classical voice students are required to sing Chinese songs as part of their repertoire requirements, alongside, for example, German leader and opera arias. This shows that this genre of repertoire has the potential to grow in the non-Chinese speaking countries if we can find a way to bridge the gap between the non-Chinese speaking world and its vocal music. This lecture recital is called Kinyin to Singing. And so I'll explain first what pinyin is. The pinyin system, or Han Yu pinyin, 
is a way to show pronunciation of the Chinese characters using the Roman alphabets. It looks like this. The pronunciation of the characters are shown by using Roman alphabets. And these accent marks you see show the tones of the language for us to know how the character is pronounced. This is a great way for non-speakers or anyone to learn how to pronounce in this language. In fact, this is used in any Chinese language course you can find around the world. This is also what we'll use today to talk about phonetics in singing in Chinese. Now, before we talk about how we use the pinyin system to figure out phonetics in singing, it is important for us to first know a little history of the language. Mandarin Chinese is also called Standard Chinese. Of course, standard because it is a variety of the language that has become the official language of China. Standard Chinese is based on the Beijing dialect, which is a type of Chinese in a group of language varieties called Mandarin. And this is why we also call Standard Chinese Mandarin Chinese. Chinese is one of the most common languages in the world. In fact, it has consistently been recorded as the language with the most speakers in the world, with 918 million speakers recorded in 2019. It is gaining popularity, especially in the West, with many young children now learning Chinese as a second language, including in the United States. The Chinese language has a very rich history due to it being one of the oldest languages in the world, first writing dated as far back as 1250 BC. Like all languages in the world, Chinese has gone through its evolution through time. The Chinese language is a unique language as it uses characters which look like pictures or logos, or by its technical terms, logograms. It means that each word has its own shape to it, and specifically in Chinese, its phonetic properties are not shown on the characters. In other words, one does not know how to pronounce a Chinese word by just looking at it. This is unlike Korean, for example, a language which also uses logogram, but its characters show the pronunciation of the words. Take this example, we have on the top, Gokmun, which means national language, and at the bottom, Hanguk, which means Korea. This part of the character shows the U vowel in Guk and Mun, and this, for example, shows the consonant G in the words Guk and Mun, uh, in the words Guk. Even if one doesn't know what any of those characters mean, one can pronounce them by just knowing the pronunciation rules. This, unfortunately, doesn't apply to Chinese. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, we cannot tell the pronunciation by just looking at the characters. This poses a question. How did people first learn the pronunciation of the language? The only way pronunciations were passed on through time is mainly through word of mouth. One would learn their pronunciation from their parents and the way people speak around them. This then creates many different varieties of dialects or accents of the language throughout history. For instance, in Old Chinese, which was used around 200 BC, Scholars have found that it has no tones and that tones only departed and settled during the Middle Chinese period. William Baxter published a book, A Handbook of Old Chinese Phonology, in 1992. Many sounds that according to him were used in Old Chinese are not used in the form of Mandarin that we speak nowadays. In fact, a lot of the sounds are very strange for modern speakers. 
Perhaps the earliest source we can find that attempts to establish or unify pronunciation of the language is the Qiyu rhyme dictionary published in 601 AD. The dictionary is a collection of the Chinese characters with their pronunciations shown using a method called fan qie. This method uses two other characters, one with the same initial sound and one with the same final sound. You see, in Chinese characters, phonetic properties are separated into two parts, an initial and a final. Because each character denotes one syllable sound, we generally do not use the combination of consonants and vowels to describe its phonetic properties. For example, in an English word, transportation, we can find these consonants and these vowels. If English is formed by only one syllable words, we can also treat them as having an initial and, and, a, and a final as shown here. Chinese pronunciation therefore works this way, with an initial sound and a final sound. So in the Qiyun rhyme dictionary, using the fan qie method, an entry will consist of two characters, one which shows the same initial and another with the same final. For example, this word which is pronounced tong it has the word, the first word t, to show the initial of t, and the second word hong to show the final ong, to show that this word is pronounced tong. If used in English, an example might be this. To know how to pronounce this word, we can refer to the initial of shoot, which is sh, and the final of rear, which is ear, to pronounce this word as shear instead of share or some other pronunciation. Mm -hmm. The problem was, everything in the Qiyun dictionary was characters. It is like trying to explain the sound of one character using two other characters, which also needed to be explained by four other characters, <laughs> and so on. It was a good system, but not a perfect one. As we moved on through time, many other ways have been proposed and used to show the pronunciation of the language. An example is Zhu Yin, which was developed in 1918, which uses a series of unique alphabets shown here to show the pronunciation. This system is still widely used in Taiwan although they have started to embrace the pinyin system due to its wide usage. There also exists the Paladia system, a serialization of uh, Chinese, which is a transcription of the Chinese pronunciations to the Cyrillic alphabets, primarily used in Russia. It is the Russian, uh, Russian official standard for transcribing Chinese into the Cyrillic alphabets. With the extensive use of Roman alphabets in the languages of the world, the Chinese pronunciation was then Romanized into systems which can be understood by more people around the world. One of these systems include the Yale Romanization of Mandarin, devised by a scholar in Yale University, Professor George Kennedy. The Wade Giles system is also another system that was very popular. It was developed by Thomas Francis Wade in the mid-19th century and completed by Herbert Giles right before the turn of the 20th century in 1892. This system is later completely replaced by the pinyin system that we will look at today. This system was developed around 1950s by many, lang many linguists include the father of Pinyin, Zhou Youguang. It was published by the Chinese government in 1958 and then recognized by the ISO, International Organization for Standardization, in 1982 and later by 
the United Nations in 1986. The pin system is now used around all around the world as the most common tool in Chinese language education to learn the pronunciation of the words. And so I'm using the pinyin system in this method to connect the language and the diction in singing. Pinyin is a consistent way to show pronunciation. As the alphabets generally connote to a certain sound in the language. The work that I had to do was then to standardize the sounds into groups with similar phonetic properties. One of it is its consonants. As mentioned earlier, the Chinese characters carry two parts of sounds in each character, an initial and a final. An initial is usually and most often made up of one consonant, while the final is generally a vowel with the possibility of an ending n or n. This means that every character in the language begins with one consonant and ends usually with a vowel or an n sound or n sound, which is good for singing because they are sung. This means that singers who sing, who sing in this language would not have to deal with consonant clusters like those that we might find, for example, in German or Czech. <laughs> <laughs> this makes singers sing for the majority of the time vowels. Now, since we have relatively few consonants, let's look at them. Consonants in general can be looked at based on the relationship between two things. One is the timing of the time of articulation, and two, the engagement of the voice. Let us take a bilabial consonant, for example, which is made by the closure of the lips. The relationship between the timing of articulation and the engagement of the voice de determines which consonant it is. On this chart, we can see that if the time of articulation marked AR happens at the same time as the engagement of the vocal cords marked VO, we have an unaspirated consonant, which sounds like pa. Now, if the voice happens after the articulation, we have an aspirated consonant. Pa. Pa. If the voice happens before the articulation, we have a voiced consonant. Va. Va. Let me do that again. If they happen at the same time, it becomes Pa. If the voice happens after, it becomes pa. And if the voice happens before, it becomes ba. So then this gives us three categories of consonants. Unaspirated, aspirated, and voiced. In English, all three forms of consonants exist, but most consonants are aspirated consonants. In Italian, the aspirated category of consonants does not exist. For example, the word caro does not become more expressive by adding aspiration to it, like caro, but instead lengthening the unaspirated consonant ga. In Chinese, the voiced category of consonants does not exist. The consonants in Chinese are contrasted by the unaspirated and aspirated pairs. For example, ba and pa, but not the voiced ba, or ta and ta, 
but not the voiced da. The problem with this is that it becomes difficult for us to put them into Roman alphabets, as Roman alphabets generally show the voiced and the unvoiced pairs, like B and P, D and T, and G and K. The pinyin system has this limitation too. It puts them in the pairing of how we normally write Roman alphabets in. So, for example, in the pair B and P, P uh, B actually shows the unaspirated ba sound, not the voiced ba. And uh, D, for example, shows the unaspirated ta sound, not da. For example, in the word for father in Chinese, it is spelled with the pinyin B-A-B-A, -B -A, but it is pronounced with the unaspirated ba, as in ba, -ba but not the voiced ba, as in ba, -ba. Even if one learns the tone and makes them perfectly when they speak, the voiced consonants will then take away the authenticity of their Chinese pronunciation. With this introduction, let us listen to the performance of two songs. Pay attention to how in this language we have no voiced consonants and how few consonants there are in general. The first song is Ta. How should I not miss him? It takes the protagonist through four seasons of the year to express his yearning to his loved one. The second song is Mei San Yue, Three Wishes of the Flower Rose, which pleads for youth to not be washed away by time.
However, there are only less than 60 phonemes in Chinese. Phonemes are perceived units of sounds in a language. So for example, in Chinese, ma is a phoneme, man is another phoneme, so as tu and tuan, uh, but not tung because that sound doesn't exist in Chinese. So we only have 60. Now if we divide 8,000 characters that an educated person knows to 60 phonemes, we get about 133 characters to one phoneme. This is an approximation, of course, but imagine that you get 133 characters with the same phoneme ma in this language. It will be pretty overwhelming. This is where tones come in. Chinese is a tonal language, as many of you know. There are four distinct tones, which can be seen here. Tones are defined by the pattern of how the pitches travel through one character. So if, if I'm to use the phoneme ma to do four tones, it'll sound like this. Ma, 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 ma. Let me do that again. Ma, 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 ma. So it is the travel of pitches throughout one character. Tones play a big role in the language for it to be understood. It is an important factor in the understanding of the language. The famous phrase we use to demonstrate this is the tongue twister, or rather the tone twister. <laughs> this phrase, which sounds like Ma 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 the ma ma. <laughs> Let me do that again. Ma 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 the ma ma. It means it's mom scolding the horse's hand. <laughs> well, of course, it doesn't mean anything because, <laughs> because it is a tongue twister. But it shows how important tones are in this language. The sequence of tones has to be right, or else the meaning will be lost. Despite the importance of tones in the Chinese language, they actually disappear when they are set to music. If you remember, tones are the patterns of how the pitches travel through one character. When these characters are set to be sung on one note or more notes, they lose the tonal characteristics of the language. As tones play a big part in the understanding of the language, it can be argued that the textual importance of Chinese in music becomes less significant compared to the importance of text in the, Roma in the Romance languages, for example. Let's look at these examples. In Italian, we have this phrase, we say, O del mio amato ben. O del mio amato ben. When set to music by Donaldi, it sounds like, O del mio amato ben. Preserving the natural inflection of the language. The same goes to this song by Barbara in English, Sure on this shining night. Sure on this shining night, which is sung sure on this shining night. Now they retain a big part of the language which is inflection, and hence more essence of the text is preserved. However, if we take this line from the song Louis sang, <laughs> when set to music, the beautiful melody becomes an almost separate thing from the text. Chinese is an uninflected language, and its meaning is derived from the sequence of tones, but not from where the stresses are. 
I'll prove this point by this illustration. If you remember, this tune is set this way. And these words, these words marked green, are set on the downbeats. So, now if I'm going to change the text setting by putting different words on the downbeats, it sounds like this. For a native speaker's ear, other than that this tune is not what we are used to hearing, <laughs> nothing else has changed, including the meaning of the text. It is perceived the same despite having different words on the downbeats. This, of course, does not allow the performers to then throw away the text. In fact, the opposite is true. The articulation of the language becomes more important because the tones are lost when it's set to music. The clarity of the sounds becomes uh, more important. The clarity, this clarity, comes from the clear and correct enunciation of the consonants in the initials and the vowels in the finals. And more importantly, the difference between the unaspirated and the aspirated consonants has to be big. This is similar to uh, the difference between the long consonants and short consonants in Italian, for example, where word like a word like nona means completely different from nonna. For example, saying conosco la nona di Beethoven is very different from saying conosco la nonna di Beethoven. One is saying, I know the ninth of Beethoven, meaning the ninth symphony. Um, the other is saying, I know Beethoven's grandmother. <laughs> the, this clarity of text was then the main focus in our preparation of singing these songs. Throughout the coaching sessions with the singers, I've encountered several common challenges singers need to overcome in singing in Chinese, but also found several ways that are very effective for non-speakers to learn how to sing in this language using the pinyin system. <coughs> Before going into the process of preparing these songs with the singers, let's hear two more songs in Chinese, this time two folk songs. The first song is a boat song from the Nanai people who lives by the Usuri River between the northeast of China and Russia. The piano introduction paints the scenery of the river and the mountains and then and you will hear the singer starts by calling out to the mountains and hearing and hearing echoes from afar. The second song is a lullaby from the Manchu region which is actually very close, very close to the Usuri River.
As you know, the method I use in the phonetics of singing in Chinese is based on the pinyin system, and I call this pinyin to singing. In the preparation of this method for singers to learn the pronunciation of these songs, I first group the sounds of the consonants in a systematic way, grouping the pairs of unaspirated and aspirated consonants together according to their opinions. These sounds are then marked clearly using phonetic alphabets, mm -hmm. such as a, a P and then a P with a little H to show uh, that it is aspirated. So it, it becomes a pa and pa, for example. For vowels, I then group them according to the vowels which are dominant. What I mean by that is that the vowel, which is the main sung vowel in, uh, in a word, is the dominant vowel. This works similarly in English. For example, in an English word like try, if we are to hold this, uh, this word on a long note, we'll hold the R vowel and then do the final E at the end, like try, so the dominant vowel is ah. The vowels in Chinese work this way too. All the vowels in Chinese are vowels we use in the Romance, the romance languages. So we have ah, e, i, o, u, u, and the schwa, e. After doing all that, I then prepared phonetic transcriptions for the songs uh, that the singers are singing, just like those guys that you can find on IPA source, for example. An example is shown here. As you can see, below the words, we have the pinyin alphabets, and above the words, we have the phonetic alphabets for singing. And below them all, we have the translations. 
Putting the phonetics on top of the text and the pinyin alphabet below the text is done with a purpose. It is to train the singer to relate the sound of the language to the pinyin alphabet. Ultimately, the goal is to be able to equip one who uses, who uses this method so that they can tell the pronunciation from the pinyin so that the phonetic transcripts would not be needed anymore. Pinyin is so widely used that one can simply copy or scan a character to the computer and get its pinyin transcription. This convenience is a big reason why we use pinyin for this method. Before we conclude, I do want to bring up a group of sounds that are unique to the Chinese language. Although every sound that we have gone through here can be found in the Romance languages, there are sounds that singers are familiar, familiar with. Um, the, the sounds that are in Romance languages are the sounds that the singers are familiar with. But there do exist a group of sounds which is unique to the Chinese language. And these are called the vocalic consonants. Vocalic consonants are consonants that can form a syllable by its own, on its own. Like, for example, the consonants L, M, and N, they carry a vocalic quality, and hence it's called vocalic consonants. Uh, and it means that you can sustain a sound by holding these consonants. For example, L, M, in English, some examples are the second syllables in the words like bottle or rhythm. <clears throat> in Chinese, the vocalic consonants that form a syllable are spelled using pinyin as follows and carry the sounds from the left. S, tz, tz, sh, and the last one, r. Notice that the last one sounds exactly like the American R, r, which is something American singers really like. Um, <laughs> they can relate to the sound, but at the same time also difficult because they are taught to not, not do that in singing. Now I bring up these vocalic consonants because in singing, there needs to be a solution to these sounds. There is, that, that is, there needs to be a singable vowel on these syllables. Take the English word bottle or rhythm, for example. We don't sing bottle or rhythm, and it's, instead we, we sing a vowel on those syllables, like bottle or Rhythm. So then for these Chinese uh, vocalic consonants, I suggest a vowel similar to the central tongue vowel, U, which we can find in Russian, for example. It sounds like U. Now, this might seem like an unfamiliar sound to many of us, but we actually do hear them relatively frequently in speech, especially in America. A good example is the word good in a Southern American accent. Good, 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 right? <laughs> so, with this problem solved, all the sounds in the Chinese language is covered, and then the singers and I proceed, proceeded to working through these songs phonetically and musically. Throughout the process of coaching singers, to sing in Chinese using the pinyin system, there are several common challenges that, uh, that we have found, but also several positives using this way to sing in Chinese. In conclusion, I summarize them as follows. Number one, unaspirated and aspirated consonants can be a challenge to access. The contrast of these two types of consonants can be very counterintuitive at first because we are not used to doing them in the languages that we know. This is similar to contrasting short and long consonants in Italian, making sure that the long ones are 
long and the short ones are really short. Number two, the vocalic consonants can be tricky to navigate when transferring those sounds from the spoken form to the sound form. There needs to be a right balance so that the sound can still sound authentic while allowing the singer to sing and phonate freely. Number three, the lack of consonant clusters encourages a beautiful lyrical singing. This trains the singer to not only maintain the breath support uh, through the vowels, but also to use the voice to make musical phrasing and line. Number four, the pinyin system is a great way for singers who do not speak Chinese to learn its pronunciation, and subsequently, the phonetics of singing in this language. It is straightforward, it uses Roman alphabets, and it is systematic, so that we can produce the correct pronunciation every time. And finally, number five, the ability to sing in Chinese opens the gateway to its vocal music. There are hundreds of songs, not to mention operas, written in Chinese. If we are able to bring those repertoires here to the Western world to be performed by the singers here, it will make the music industry richer and certainly more colorful. With this, we'll then perform the rest of the program for you. The next three songs are composed by Malaysian composers in the Chinese language. The Chinese language plays a big role in the music scene in Malaysia, as many musicians are Chinese Malaysians. These three songs are some of the earliest art songs in Malaysia where composers use relatively simple harmonic and musical structure while expressing the very passionate text. The first song expresses someone's longing for the loved one. The second song is a very inspiring song about achieving one's goal. And then the third one is also a love song by singing about a lost love.
about this thing, uh, if you couldn't tell already. Uh, I want to thank my singers, especially the three non-speakers. You guys are so brave, um, taking the time to learn this. Uh, I'm sure you didn't go to your, your first voice lesson thinking you would sing a Chinese song. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chao and Michelle, for helping uh, with the slides and the camera. Um, yes, this is the last recital in my program. Uh, it is crazy because I arrived 2017 uh, and time just, just flew just like that. Um, I want to take a, an opportunity to thank uh, this person who believed in my abilities and uh, accepting me to this place and quite literally changed my life, Professor Katz. There is a quote by Nelson Mandela that I really like. Um, he said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his own language, that goes to his heart. And today, I'm going to say this in my own language, and hence from my own heart. Thank you, Professor. Also, thank you, my, uh, my committee members, Professor West, uh, Professor Chang, you're, you're all here. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this lecture recital has given you some insights about the language and its music. Um, hopefully, not too long in the future, we are, when we are able to perform freely to public, uh, we can have more Chinese vocal music performed. Um, not because of any reasons, but because of its beauty. 
Have a nice rest of your days. Stay safe and stay sanitized. <laughs>